And now to our third antiphon. It is um, Monday, the 7th of December, and we are going to look at the root of Jesse. That's one of the names, um, Old Testament predictions of a Messiah that would be in the future. Today, I'll do a short uh, call to prayer from Psalm 54 two. I'll do the third antiphon and then the Old Testament reading or Hebrew Testament reading from Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 10. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth and the antiphon. O root of Jesse, come. This ensign raised for all to whom the nations pray, before whom kings keep silent, to rescue quickly come. And from Isaiah 11, a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. So we have been talking about the various uh, characters in this play of Christmas these last couple of days, and we've done... Um, the angels and the baby Jesus and Joseph and Mary. Now we're turning to let heaven and nature sing. Shine forth and let your light restore earth's own true loveliness once more. By Charles Coffin on Jordan's Bank. Modern children who have ever seen a live manger scene never forget it. The early American caroler William Billings boldly sings, the oxen are near him, and blow on your God. St. Francis preached the animals and treated them like brothers and sisters. When one first hears a French carol sing of rushing wings, it reminds of angels, but no, it means the birds of the air. Whence comes this rush of wings afar, following straight the Noel star? Birds from the woods in wondrous flight, Bethlehem, seek this holy night. The Magi are drawn to a special star. To those who can see, the night sky reveals a change in the universe. The claim of Christmas is that heaven and earth are brought together again. Matter is touched by spirit, and the earth becomes a sacrament of divine presence, not merely the dreary place of sin. The incarnation means the enchantment of all creatures. The Christmas rose and the branch of Jesse are well-known metaphors for nature, mysteriously reborn at Christmas. Isaiah had prophesied that from the stump of Jesse, the apparent dead end of the Davidic line, when Israel went into exile, new life would one day emerge. The branch, the new life, became a rose ever blooming. The holly and the ivy are metaphors for the Virgin Mary and for the passion of Christ, if also for male and female. Finally, there is the obvious, the winter solstice. Of course, Christmas has something to do with, with bleak December, with the dying of light. Most famously, the hallowing of nature is expressed in a speech in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Some say that ever gainst that season comes, wherein our Savior's birth is celebrated. The bird of dawning singeth all night long, and then they say no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome, then no planets strike, no fairy takes, nor which hath power to charm, so hallowed and so gracious is the time. And, of course, we can't go through this without the shepherds being part of it. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why these joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be, which inspire your heavenly song? There are no shepherds in Matthew's account, but Luke makes them the first witnesses to the Christmas miracle. They hear the angel's proclamation, they go to see for themselves, and they praise God and tell everyone. Children of the modern age dress in ridiculous bathrobes and play the part of shepherds in Sunday school Christmas pageants throughout the land. Of all the characters of Christmas one might wish to meet, the shepherds seem the most approachable. 
Christmas pageants, in fact, reach back to the Middle Ages, as liturgy was given rise to drama, and early Easter play gives its lines to Christmas. Once angels at the tomb asked, whom do you seek? Now the question is put to Christmas purpose. As a medieval congregation on Christmas morning imagines shepherds arriving at the manger in search of the infant Christ, two deacons get the first lines ever in a church Christmas line, Christmas play. You shepherds, whom are you looking for in the crib? Tell us. Cantors respond, the Savior Christ the Lord, the infant wrapped in tatters, as the angel told us. When Christmas plays leave the sanctuary of the church, people want ever more. Because Holy Day and Holiday are birds of a feather, shepherds' plays performed in the squares outside cathedrals are soon turning to body humor. In a 15th century English play, the newborn is actually a lamb stolen by a shifty shepherd and disguised so that the others who come looking will not find it. The thief says to his wife, Get ready, and I shall say you were delivered of a boy child this night. The shepherds scrutinize. The wife plays her part. The thief dissembles. Eventually, one of the suspicious shepherds wants to give a small gift to the child, lifts up his cloth, just to give him a kiss and discovers that the baby looks remarkably like their lost sheep. After an argument over the baby's features, an angel appears and the play turns to the proclamation of the meaning of Christmas. Sheep and shepherds were familiar images of Israel and of God in the Old Testament. Sheep were affectionate, defenseless, and in constant need of care and supervision. So Israel said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Religious leaders were expected to be good shepherds, though they often were not. The Gospel of John proclaims Jesus as the ultimate good shepherd. But in first century Palestine, shepherds got no respect. Now, most quaint, mostly quaint, the original shepherds were unlikely candidates for epiphany. Unshaven and drinking hard, shepherds stared among the thieving and cheating profession. I'm, I'm sorry, shepherds starred in among the thieving and cheating professions. They could not hold office or be admitted as witnesses in court, just because of who they were. They are important to Luke, who always makes heroes of the lowly, the marginalized, the foreigner, and women. God was sublimely ironical to call shepherds, who could not be trusted as the first witnesses to the Incarnation. And of course, we have to have the wise men. We three are wise ones, we three kings of Orient are. The Eastern sages saw from far and followed on his guiding star. By light their way to light they trod and by their gifts confessed their God, Sedulius. Luke gives us no magi, but Matthew makes them register the com cosmic significance of Jesus' birth. They appear as astrologers who have noticed a star and come to Jerusalem to see what the birth of a new king portends. As the court arouses and King Herod plots, the wise men move quickly to Bethlehem, present royal gifts to the child, and warned by God, return to their origins by another route. The Magi are the most mysterious characters in the Christmas story, and the ones most susceptible to imaginative expansion. The wise men were elevated to royalty based on Matthew's implicit citation of Psalm 72, 10 and 11, where kings bring tribute to Jerusalem. Then they were three, since they brought three gifts, but the early traditions ranged from two to four to twelve. Once named and representative of the races, one of them became black. In an Armenian myth, the wise men are the three sons of Noah, raised from the dead to represent all humankind, worshiping the Christ, who is the second Adam. Their gifts become metaphors of the child's kingship, divinity, and burial. Of course, the Magi needed to acquire names. A medieval calendar of saints has them meeting one last time in 54 CE to celebrate Christmas. Thereupon, after Mass, they died. Melchior, on January 1st, Balthazar, on January 6th, and Gaspar on January 11th. Long ago, their bones were carried in imperial procession in Constantinople to sanctify the emperor's rule. 
The Emperor Zeno in 490 had brought them there from Persia. Then they went west to Milan because of the Muslim threat. A bell tower there still bears a star, not a cross, in their honor. In 1162, as part of the booty from a ravaged Italy, Emperor Frederick Bar Barbarossa brought them to Cologne, where they became the three kings of Cologne, entombed in a marvelous golden and bejeweled casket and the city's most famous relic by far, that still is seen and marveled over today. In 1906, a few bones were returned to Milan in a gesture of goodwill, but the great reliquary uh, in Cologne, begun in 1181 and completed in 1200, summoned pilgrims from everywhere. Guessing the commercial value of the Magi's gifts even drove interest in trade, of which they became emblems. World travelers, Matthew's Magi, have gone forth in the company of Byzantine emperors, German kings, Medici bankers, and South American chieftains. They behold and proclaim utter universality of Christ. If the church learned how to render the Magi for holy purposes, the world soon turned them to secular ends. One could write a political, sociological, economic history in which the Magi legitimate the divine right of kings or the orders, customs and structures of society and culture, just as Matthew had made them effective witnesses to the Christ. Even up to the present, the star above the creche and the Magi following it transforms social and political universe says into astral, heavenly terms. As needed, the Magi can morph from kings to wise men. As wise men, they stand in for exoticism, the occult, the legendary Old Testament priest Melchizedek, and the mysteries of the ancient world. Once and again, they offer almost magical protection. It is said that when the Persians invaded Palestine and took Bethlehem in 614 CE, they found magi among the mosa mosaics dressed just like them and spared the whole basilica. In early modern Europe, as the political significance of the magi came to an end, they came to play their roles. They are ageless beings who come to re-enchant the world. They hint of a wisdom beyond urban life. Astrology, whenever it happens, is a kind of science in service of the sacred. As with other characters in the major scene, the Magi, like dolls, can be dressed, arranged, and moved around to fit human fancy. And the last, of course, is Herod and the Holy Innocence. All hail, ye infant martyr flowers, cut off in life's first dawning hours. Producius. Luke's infancy narrative is sunnier than Matthew's. Juxtaposed with Matthew's delightful story of the wise men's visit is its aftermath. King Herod, crazy with jealousy over a newborn king of the Jews, slaughters all the babies in Bethlehem under age two. Because what liberation theology calls Matthew's dangerous memory goes unheeded today, and because Christmas shoppers cannot imagine that Herod still rages. Matthew's awful story uh, is indispensable to biblical realism. On December 28th, the Festival of the Holy Innocents is on the Christian calendar, but celebrated by almost no one today. The tragedy in Matthew's drama is revealed in the heart-wrenching cries of the mothers of Bethlehem as they plead with and then curse the slain soldiers. The Holy Innocents cast a backward shadow over Christmas, and they are meant to. Jesus was born under the sign of state power, Matthew wants his readers to see that as the baby grows up, his claims provoke a crisis. He pays for this with his life, but in the view of Christian theology, he takes death, even these babies, up into the life of God. The caring capacity of Matthew's account is an interesting contrast to a sentimentalized baby or infantilized adults. Possibly the earliest stage direction in European drama is Here Herod Rages. The drama in the mystery plays of Matthew's stories comes out in the grotesque dialogue between Herod and his soldiers and at the heart-wrenching moment when the mothers of Bethlehem, arguing and screaming at the soldiers who are killing their babies, break into dialect to express hopeless rage or quietly sing the Coventry Carol, 
a song originally connected to a medieval play. Herod the king, in his raging, charged he hath this day, his men of might, his own, in his own sight, all young children to slay. Although Herod's evil and the baby's innocence and their mother's grief once tantalized the European imagination, including for their melodramatic potential, they play hardly any role today. Matthew's ominous ingredient is a litmus test for the realism of contemporary celebration. And that ends the characters of our play, as Heinz has depicted. And to our churches, our denominations credit, uh, we do every three years have that text from Matthew and one of the Sundays after Christmas. And uh, most often, I think it gets, um, you know, passed over for other texts because we don't want to put people in a bad mood, but we certainly know. The realism of this world and the Herods still alive in it. Uh, on that note, <laughs> let's pray a prayer. I think we need it today, huh? Let's pray. Lord God, fill our hearts with love for all nations and our minds with understanding to serve them so that our actions will be pleasing to you. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus through your Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you have a blessed day today.